Hi, thanks for logging in to watch this uh, PowerPoint lecture on the use of ketamine for treatment-resistant depression and chronic pain. My name is Jason Duprat. I am a nurse anesthesiologist. I practice at nurse anesthesia in both the military and also as a civilian. I've been in the Navy Reserves for uh, going on seven years. And um, I also am the founder of the Injection and Infusion Clinic of Albuquerque, which is a clinic that specializes in ketamine infusion therapy for depression, PTSD, and chronic pain. I am a ketamine infusion educator. I've actually developed an online platform and have um, been fortunate enough to be able to help over 50 providers nationwide learn how to start and grow ketamine practices. We also even have um, a couple of international students that we've taught. We also do an in-clinic training program. So today we're going to learn a little bit about why ketamine is such a great antidepressant. We will take a little dive into ketamine pharmacology, and then we'll take a brief tour on the history of ketamine. And lastly, we'll discuss ketamine's use in chronic pain. This is depression. Depression affects men, women, young, and old. Depression affects people of all socioeconomic backgrounds and all ethnicities. When ineffectively treated, depression often leads to drug and alcohol abuse. In the worst of cases, depression can lead to suicide. In fact, over 75% of individuals who commit suicide suffer from depression. It's estimated that over 2,000 people die each day from suicide. Suicide is actually the second leading cause of death for individuals ages 18 to 29. Depression affects over 300 million people worldwide. It is the leading cause of disability. In fact, depression now surpasses HIV, AIDS, malaria, diabetes, and war as the leading cause of disability worldwide. Over 41 million Americans are currently taking an antidepressant. Traditional antidepressants are ineffective in up to 50% of these patients. And when they do actually work, they often take weeks to months to take effect. Most antidepressants are known to have many unpleasant side effects. These include things such as suicidal ideation, depression, insomnia, headaches, dizziness, nausea, and more. When antidepressants don't work, the most common recommended treatment is electroconvulsive therapy, also known as ECT. ECT is a method of passing an electrical current through the brain to cause a seizure. Side effects such as permanent memory loss, dental injury, physical trauma, cardiovascular complications, and skin burns are all possible. So why ketamine for depression? Well, ketamine reverses the loss of neuronal connections and reverses brain atrophy that is often seen in depressed patients. Through these mechanisms, ketamine provides rapid and robust relief of depression symptoms. In the year 2000 at Yale University, the first study was published on the use of ketamine for depression. In this study, the majority of patients had at least a 50% decrease in their symptoms of depression after just a single ketamine infusion. This study showed that the results of a single infusion lasted on average about a week, and we now know that a series of six infusions provides antidepressant effects that can last several weeks all the way up to several months in some patients. Since this first study in 2000, dozens of additional studies have been published providing evidence for the safety and efficacy of ketamine infusions. Depression symptoms are often decreased within just hours of a single ketamine infusion in many cases. Ketamine has also been shown to produce a rapid reversal of suicidal ideations. Ketamine is actually now being used in ERs all around the country to treat suicidal emergencies. Ketamine has been so effective that it prompted this statement from the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. Quote, Recent data suggests that ketamine, given intravenously, may be the most important breakthrough in antidepressant treatment in decades. Dr. Tom Insel, director of the National Institute of Mental Health. 
The results of ketamine infusions have been so promising that the FDA awarded breakthrough therapy designation for the research and development of a new intranasal ketamine spray. This is actually the first time the special designation has ever been awarded for a mental health medication. Ketamine is presenting itself as a great option for patients suffering from treatment-resistant depression. Here at our clinic, the protocol involves administering a series of six infusions over the course of about two weeks. Each of these infusions is 40 minutes long, followed by a 30 to 45 minute recovery period. This protocol produces the longest duration of antidepressant effects. On average, we're seeing four to six weeks, and in some cases, we're seeing up to several months of relief from depression symptoms. After this initial series, patients will return to our clinic on an as-needed basis for just a single maintenance infusion. Ketamine has been shown to be effective in approximately 70 to 80% of patients, and that's in the most difficult to treat cases of treatment-resistant depression. Patients undergoing ketamine infusions may experience um, things such as floating sensations, some mild dizziness. Some patients have some nausea during the infusions, which is actually easily treated with an IV antiemetic. Pretty frequently we see a mild increase in heart rate or blood pressure during the infusion, usually not more than 10 or 15 points from their baseline. Patients sometimes also describe um, a heightened sensitivity to bright lights and extraneous loud noises. So in our infusion clinic, we provide our ketamine infusions in a dimly lit setting with uh, white noise makers and a relaxing spa-like environment. So to summarize the major benefits of ketamine for depression, first it is the world's only rapid acting antidepressant. It is highly effective even in the most difficult to treat cases of depression, and it has the ability to rapidly terminate suicidal ideations. Limitations of the ketamine infusion are that it's not covered by most insurances, and it has a fairly inconvenient route of administration. So now let's take a little dive into the ketamine pharmacology. So ketamine is an NMDA receptor blocker. So it temporarily blocks the most excitatory neurotransmitter called glutamate. By blocking this NMDA receptor, and glutamate, there's ultimately an increase in glutamate activity in the brain. Ketamine is able to bind to multiple different receptors at the cellular level, including cholinergic receptors, opioid receptors, and GABA receptors. Ketamine increases the, neuronal, uh, the neurotransmitter activity, which leads to improved cellular signaling. This is the result of an increase in a substance called BDNF. Ketamine also increases generation of synapses, something called synaptogenesis. Reversal of neuronal atrophy is also possible with ketamine. So in this photo, you can see two images of brain scans. The image on the left demonstrates the brain scan of a depressed patient. And you'll notice there's areas of inactivity, fairly dark areas. And you want to compare that to the image on the right, which is a brain scan of a normal functioning brain, a patient without depression. What we've seen in the studies is that ketamine is able to cause an increase in neuronal activity of depressed patients, resulting in a brain scan that looks very similar to that of a non-depressed patient, the one that's on the right here. This image here illustrates ketamine's ability to cause neuronal growth. On the top of this image, you'll see an, an, uh, an image of a neuron before ketamine administration. On the bottom, you'll see a neuron after two hours of exposure to ketamine. The little areas of arrows are pointing towards dendritic connections. And you'll notice that after ketamine exposure, nerves have started to increase the number of dendritic connections, ultimately leading to cell growth and increased neuronal function. So where did ketamine come from? It was actually first synthesized in 1962 at Park Davis Laboratories by the gentleman you see here in this picture. His name is Calvin Stevens. He's a PhD professor at Wayne State University. At the time of his research, ketamine was actually designated with the chemical investigation number 581. We commonly now know it as ketamine. So ketamine was actually first tested in monkeys, and this is where it was found to possess excellent anesthetic properties. In 1964, the first dose of ketamine was administered to human volunteers. And these volunteers described their experience as, quote, very strange and being associated with a feeling of floating in space. They also described having less sensation in their arms and legs 
and a feeling of being disconnected from their environment. Researchers coined the term dissociative anesthetic in an attempt to describe these effects. So in 1970, ketamine was approved by the FDA as an anesthetic suitable for children, adults, and in the elderly. Ketamine was used extensively by the military in the Vietnam War, and it's still used as an analgesic and anesthetic in both the military and in civilian medicine today. Ketamine is one of the safest medications used for emergencies in these remote settings because it does not cause respiratory depression, nor does it cause a decrease in blood pressure. In 1985, ketamine was added to the World Health Organization's list of the world's essential medicines. In the 1990s, researchers at Yale University began to explore the use of ketamine in psychiatry. Around the same time in the 1990s, interest began growing rapidly in the use of ketamine to treat chronic pain. Neurologists were the first specialists to actually use ketamine for the treatment of chronic pain, and they initially used it for the treatment of complex regional pain syndrome. So now let's just talk a little bit about the chronic pain and ketamine's use in that arena. So chronic pain is another worldwide ailment. It costs the U.S. approximately $365 billion a year due to absenteeism, reduced productivity, disability, and its associated healthcare costs. Chronic pain causes physiologic changes at the cellular level. These include oversensitized neurons, a spinal windup, which causes a persistent state of hyperactivity, also sometimes referred to as central sensitization, and chronic pain also causes neuroinflammation. So ketamine works for chronic pain, primarily by, by blocking that NMDA receptor. Ketamine also has mild activity at opioid receptors um, specifically the mu and kappa receptors. Ketamine is able to reduce the hyperactivity caused by that spinal windup. Ketamine reduces something called allodynia. An example of allodynia would be something like you would see here in this picture where somebody's touching the infant's skin and that light touch can cause some patients suffering from allodynia some excruciating pain. Ketamine also reduces hyperalgesia. Hyperalgesia is the body's increased sensitivity to a stimulus that is normally only mildly painful due to this hyperalgesia that mild stimulus is producing excruciating pain. Ketamine also possesses some anti-inflammatory properties. Um, this is mediated by the release of adenosine in the periphery. So this leads to decreased secretion of inflammatory substances. We also now know that ketamine also possesses some mild local anesthetic properties. Ketamine is has been successfully used to treat many types of chronic neuropathic pain, including ischemic limb pain, trigeminal neuralgia, the pain we see after shingles, something called post-herpetic neuralgia, which is actually caused by the varicella zoster virus. Ketamine also has the ability to reduce phantom limb pain, often seen in amputees. And now several studies demonstrate that it is very effective in treating the pain from fibromyalgia. During a ketamine infusion, patients can expect to uh, have some very potent pain relief and there's several studies now showing that a series of infusions can produce long-term pain relief, oftentimes several weeks, all the way up to many months in some cases. In order to obtain this longer-term pain relief, research is showing us that we need to, to administer a series of infusions between 4 and 14 days. Patients undergoing ketamine infusions for chronic pain have the same experiences as they would for depression. So they may get that floaty sensation, some mild nausea, mild increase in blood pressure. The only major difference is that there's increased chance of the patient having increases in vivid imagery. So to summarize, the major benefits of ketamine for pain include the ability to reduce opioid intake, ketamine's ability to produce long-term pain reduction, and it's also its ability to be used in a variety of painful conditions. The limiting factors of ketamine for pain are the same as that you see for depression, so that it's not covered by most insurances, and the route of administration is somewhat inconvenient for most patients. So we're happy to answer any questions you may have. You can log on to our website at www.infusionclinicabq.com. There you can read the frequently asked questions section, and you can also self-schedule a free consultation. We're also happy to talk to you over the phone. Um, you can call us anytime. At, our phone number is 1-800-679-4951. I hope you found this presentation to be fairly informative. Hopefully now you can understand the benefits of ketamine for both depression and chronic pain. Thank you.